Guys, welcome to another episode of Ben Clymer Presents. We are presenting the New York December 2023 auction season. We are coming off some pretty weird results, if you can even call them that, results at all, in, in Hong Kong um, from our friends at Phillips and Christie's and, and other. We had the Oak Sale, um, which was tumultuous, I would say. Um, some of the, the top lots not selling at all, uh, then others doing okay. We had a traditional Christie sale, which did a little bit better, and then we had a Phillips sale, which did did, did okay as well. Um, but now we're in New York. The world is a weird place right now. We spent this morning and this afternoon looking at Sotheby's and Phillips. What do we think, Tony? Ben, thanks for having me on the show again. I think to start it off, I think there's sort of uh, a lot of cautiousness in the market, I think, just talking to the specialists. Uh, there's some good watches there that seem to have a lot of interest at both sales. But beyond that, a lot of sort of cautious talk about how much interest there is in the sales. Uh, that said, we saw a lot of good watches. I think we really focused on seeing vintage watches today, guys, mm -hmm. yeah. which was cool. We saw some vintage stuff too, or some modern stuff too, I should say. Some RMs I was excited to see that we'll get into, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, but a lot of cautious talk, I think, in the in the sales rooms today. Yeah. I kind of wonder if, uh, you know, it was maybe a good thing for Phillips to get their uh, one pass lot out of the way in Geneva. The, the uh, solitary pass lot. Yeah. The single I mean, red sea dweller. Yeah. And it was, I don't know how many years since they've had a pass lot. And I think many. it's yeah. at some point it was bound to happen. Right. And, and I happen to know that that watch did sell after the auction. Uh, you know, it was bound to happen. I, I know that they'll obviously want to sell every single lot, but there was a part of me that thought like, well, if you know you're not going to get it in the room, don't push it too hard. Don't mm -hmm. try to find somebody because you're going to have it happen at some point. The market seems to be heading that direction anyway, and mm -hmm. it's sort of a an albatross around your neck at some point to to feel like you have to sell every single lot for Phillips. Mm -hmm. Now we can kind of get back into like, okay, what is a real auction going to be like? Yeah, and I think that that's kind of what we're what both of you guys are insinuating here. Like, it's almost a return to pre-COVID pandemonium right like this is like this is what auctions used to be like which is like okay like there's some amazing top lots that you know the usual suspects or maybe some x factors will come in and, and you know throw down on but you don't really know what's going to happen uh in, until you get to the, the day of the sale and that's exciting i think for a lot of us that are kind of casual or professional observers to, to all this stuff I do you want to go ahead oh i think the one disappointment for me looking sort of across everything and i'm, I'm excited about the sales but i think when the auction houses are feeling what we're feeling. They're trying to maximize every single lot and the amount of time that they put in. And so I know for a fact that one auction house in particular decided nothing below five thousand dollar estimate. Nothing. Don't don't spend our time. Put that in in online sales um, because there's there's only so much um, time. We're not going back to the days of four hundred lots in an auction generally. Right. Um, Which was a drag, to be clear. It was I, don't, a, I don't want that. I don't want that either. I do want some of those like sneaky picks that you can pick up, but yeah. um, but I think you know we're gonna sort of reach a middle ground yeah. on on the two. Yeah, I, I agree, and and then we'll get into what we saw today. I think that there's this really challenging middle ground of like offering things that enthusiasts really like, like you guys, myself, our, our readers and listeners, and then also being able to you know have things make economic sense for for an auction. I remember somebody publicly suggested that Aurel host a uh Jager Le Coult reverso auction like a thematic reverso auction and it was just like that just like that would be very challenging to do for for obvious reasons there's not that many interesting reversos out there that would that would inspire that much it's not like Daytona or, or Daydate or anything like that so you have one side of like offering things that aren't available elsewhere in these special auctions because it's a special format and then having it make financial sense so like I'm surprised that Frankly, people didn't come to that conclusion earlier that you kind of needed a, a certain floor of, of value to, to to go into auctions. But enough about that. Tony, take us down the list here. To me, the reverso is the forgotten icon, but we'll leave that for another it's day. It's a total icon. Lenny Kravitz says so. <laughs> no, it's it's 100% an it's icon. I, I own one, as you know. It's a great watch. So we went to Sotheby's first today. We yeah. saw a bunch of watches there. I think we're going to take it by brand a little bit, guys. So let's okay. start with let's start with Paddock. I think we focused on... Vintage paddocks, we saw 1518 there. We saw mm. 1463 there. Mm -hmm. Some 25, 26s. Mm -hmm. Ben, why don't you kick it off for us and what stuck out to you from e Sotheby's paddocks? Yeah, selection. I mean, the 1518 pink, I'm going to defer to you guys on uh, legitimately because I think you actually might know more about that market right now than I do. The the, the highlight for me was the 1463 Breguet Tiffany, right? So that watch 
is everything a vintage watch should be. Uh, it's not perfect, which I think a vintage watch should not be, because I think, like, what's the point of being an old thing if it hasn't lived a life? Uh, it is polished. The the dial has, like, a real warmth to it and, you know, what you could call patina or dirt or whatever you want to call it. But the fact that it's a, a yellow gold watch, which to me is, like, quintessential vintage watch, plus Tiffany, plus Breguet, is really very neat. And, you know, this is not one of those, like, hey, fresh to market, like, from the original family sitting there for 50 years in a drawer. It was sold quite publicly by Davide Parmigiani, who's a, a great and well-known dealer. It was in one of his catalogs. Um, so it's not, it's not, it doesn't have that kind of, like, fresh to market charm, but it's still just an incredible watch. And I've never seen another Tiffany 1463 like this anywhere. I've seen kind of the later series ones, a little bit like my, my 1968 Cartier signed 1463, which have smaller signatures, really bright white dials, uh, the stamping is in a different position, usually down below. This is a this is a proper vintage watch, and I think, you know, the, the folks at at, at Sotheby's say like, you know, that people are holding their cards pretty tight to the chest. But this is a very compelling watch. It just comes down to the number on this watch. I mean, this is a watch that that I would love to own. It just would depend on on the number. And I think, gold, yellow gold, you know, worn vintage Patek is uh, it's starting to pick up a little bit again, but it has not been the hottest thing in the world over the past five years. We could say that. You mentioned numbers. Do you want to talk numbers? I mean, it's got an estimate of two to four hundred thousand yeah. dollars. Do you have any feel for what it's compelling at? For maybe even you personally, I don't know. Uh, I mean, look, if, if I were in the market, I, for me, it's under compelling. Now, I'm not saying it's actually going to sell, but it's under right. three for sure. Um, will it sell for that? Probably not. Um, you know, I think it's special enough where uh, it could go much higher. I think if the case were a little bit thicker, it could do serious numbers. I think, but you know, I, I'm not one of those guys that's super you know, militant about unpolished cases, like watches have lives, just like we, we all do. Um, I'm okay with a little bit of a polish on a watch. I just think like, you know, this is a really special thing. So to get a big number for a yellow gold 1463, uh, you're going to need something pretty special on, in the case department. Um, we'll talk about another 1463 at Phillips later, um, which, you know, I would say is a little bit stronger in, in, the, in the case arena, but has other things going for it for sure. But the 1463J Tiffany Breguet, that, that is a very me watch. It's a very compelling watch for sure. It's not one that I would have necessarily, if I was in the market, jumped at from photos and then I handled it. I said that to you in person. Like yeah. I handled it a little bit more and the white dials that pop out a little bit more, they're they're a little more compelling uh, on, on paper. But it's also the fact that it's been worn. If I had a collection of watches in a similar price point, I would actually feel comfortable wearing this out, wearing it around, meeting people, having something that's a little special, not feeling too precious about it yeah. versus other things. Because uh, that I think that is a concern is, you know, you if it's been worn, you, it doesn't have to sit in the Right, you can continue to wear it. Yeah. And I think that that's, you know, my, my the 1463 Cartier that I had, like that was a similar condition in, in many ways in that like it was, it was worn quite quite famously uh, and you could wear it and like it felt good wearing it and you didn't have to baby it. And this 1463 is very much that. There are other watches around that are, you know, could sell for a lot more that you really, I, I would be uncomfortable wearing because like, oh shit, I just put the first scratch in this perfectly mint lug you know? or or even the dial like if, if the dial starts to pick up some sort of patina that it, you didn't see before or you're worried about it and you're always looking at it like oh is that dial did yeah. i did i do something did I, was it too humid out there when mm -hmm. i walked out the door one day or something so i think that was a really compelling watch for me and i really i mean like who doesn't love Breguet? sure period tiffany is always interesting we had a conversation about this at sotheby's is where tiffany was stamping on that day and what guy was doing right. the stamping and stuff like that it, yeah. it, it does lend some sort of interest because it's always going to be a little different yeah. and that could be scary to some yep. some buyers but that's another reason not not saying that auction houses have been infallible but that's another reason no, that i do like seeing watches that have gone through a lot of hands yeah and as, as you mentioned like where they t stamp tiffany like I, I have never researched this so don't quote me on this but like in my mind now that i think about it like the stamp up top is earlier, generally speaking, than stamps down below. So th there was a publicly available 1463 later, like 1968, 60, 67, 68, with the stamp down below. My Cartier stamp was down below. If you look at like a 25, 26 Tiffany, which are 50s watches, the stamp is up high. Uh, and so this watch had the stamp up high, which to me, as you rightly point out, is, is definitely a neat thing. Well, there was that compelling Tiffany 25, 26 that I think just sold at, at Phillips in yes. Hong Kong for... A good amount of money, I want to say, which is my transition into asking you, Mark, now that we've exhausted the 1463 conversation, if there's any other vintage paddocks you saw at Sotheby's that, that really took you. 
Well, I mean, we we discussed quite a bit the 1518 that was there, and that one definitely st- stood out. I've seen a weird number of them for a short amount of time that I've been in in the watch industry. Um, it is a really still rare and special watch, but the one it's is the watch. Right? It's the watch. Yeah. Um, even to me, I would say I would probably lean more to fifteen eighteen over twenty four ninety nine, despite size and all these other factors, just because it is it is the originating watch. But I, it surprises me how many I've seen for how few there there are. Um, and that one I think did stand out, but it's it it does start to blend together a little bit. I don't know if uh, if you. I mean, when you see them back to back, that helps. Which we did. Which we did, and which which helps. But then you try to think back over the last year of maybe seeing a half dozen or more. um, What stands out? This one I definitely think was was a good one, despite not necessarily being like the strangest style or anything like that. Yeah, I know for a fact, after talking to Sotheby specialists, some of the fact that so many fifteen eighteens have come up over the past few years originates from the fact that in twenty twenty one in New York they had that pink on pink fifteen eighteen that sold for. About $10 million, like one of the most expensive vintage watches ever sold. Ever. Right. And it was an absolutely mint, you know, probably the best pink pink on pink 1518 on the planet. Yeah. I know for a fact some watches have come to Sotheby's specifically since that consignment. Um, In- including this one, I believe. I think that might be true. I, yeah. I can't know. I don't know about this one specifically. I know about the last pink on pink they sold uh, in New York back in June. That That's the case. Um, it, that, that watch that sold for $10 million is probably the best watch I've ever seen in person, the best vintage watch I've ever seen in person. So nothing really compares to that, but it also set in a drawer for 70 years. So it's it's tough to compare. This one's not perfect, but as you were talking about with the 1463, um, it comes from the original owner. It's It's got a nice condition report, honestly, documenting. It's been polished. The dial's not perfect, but it looks good. It's a good, honest watch from, I think it's the Kaplan family, from the original owner. Uh, you, there's literally even a photo or a portrait that, that they painted of the guy wearing the watch in the 60s or the 70s. Uh, so you kind of know the entire history of the watch, the story of it coming to market. And yep. for me, that's something you see less and less with Vintage Paddock in general, uh, it, just knowing the entire sort of provenance. And, and this one hasn't traded hands and dealers haven't gotten their hands on it yet, which is something that remains sort of exciting to me. Well, and it adds to sort of the legacy of these things too. I mean, we were, we were talking about earlier today, the fact that like, a number of years ago we thought that there were maybe eight uh pink 1518s and now there's 15 is sort of the number and right. and they they come out now i i do feel maybe a little bit for the family because uh or any family that would discover this only so much that i could feel badly for somebody that all of a sudden discovers a million dollar watch sure um but you know you're not going to get the 10 million dollars no. and i and i wonder i often wonder how much they really understand that like how much they're hoping or or whatever it is but um i mean it's nice to have one more scholarship i don't know i've i've not seen all of them so i can't rank them yeah but it does help you understand what these things look like what variations they've come in that yeah. kind of thing yeah i think the the, the delta between like a, a 9.5 and a 10 in terms of 15 18 is like the price is going to be significant you know the the, the very the best in the world at which every it, in, in this case, I think most would agree that, that Tony is right here. The one that they sold previously is probably the best in the world. You're going to get many X, the, the price, at that level. Because you're talking about, frankly, the wealthiest, most educated watch consumers on the planet going for this stuff. It's not your average guy. It's not you, me, or you You know, going, going for this stuff. And so to have the very best 1518, which you know John Goldberger famously has said is kind of like it's it is his favorite watch, and so many others have, have, as well, um, you're going to sell for, for many X. But I, I think... It's so fascinating because, like, that watch, which, as you said, comes from the original family, like, that is an incredible thing, and yet we saw two of them today. Speaking on condition, that brings us to the vintage Rolex portion of today's Sotheby's discussion. I wanted to start us by talking about the John Player special that we saw. It's a 6241. Um, Ben, what did you think of that watch? Killer. That is fresh to the market, original family, just fucking dead mint, and it, it should go crazy. I mean, it's one of the nicest I've seen in a long time and this one deserves to go at auction um and just let let the market kind of price it as as it sees fit you know i love that you said that you love gold daytonas as opposed to most people that don't don't i mean i'm sure they are out there but like that's the thing that i think was said a little bit when we were looking at this watch it's like i hate to admit it i'm that guy no 100 percent. I, I would, I would a, kill to be that guy it's such a good watch uh to me pops a lot more than like the lemon paul newman's uh do condition was fantastic i think it's interesting because you look closely at these watches and you see 
even if the condition is fantastic, the little ways that these watches differ from each other, even not necessarily polishing or whatever, just like these were to some extent, not necessarily mass produced in the same way that we mass produce That's watches correct. now. And so everything, everything has its own little thing, but this is, this is a great watch. Yeah. And we've seen, we've seen a few kind of like the pink 1518s. Like we've seen a few JPS has come out over the past few years, including even at Sotheby's. This is right up there in my opinion. Well, so one of the last ones we saw was Sotheby's back in May. They sold one and it went for about $2 million. Mm. Uh, Mark and I both were in the room actually. So we saw Rolex won that watch and it sold for $2 million. So I don't think we're going to expect that same price, but yeah. they've got a four to $600,000 estimate it on it. Should, on it this should crush one. that, right? I, I think it's a seven figure watch, right? I, I think I th if it's not, I think something, the market has changed a lot if it's not, you know? Um, so yes, I do think it's a, it's a low seven figure watch. And I think the other thing about these is like, this is a watch that you don't necessarily know who the people are in the room for a Rolex the same way that you do for, you know, a Patek or specifically like an AP or Vacheron that yep. might be a high t ticket thing. Yeah. You could have some guy roll in, uh, you know, some kid in his 30s or 20s in a Ferrari and decide that he's going to drop $2 million on this because he at least knows enough to know that this is a killer watch yep. and uh, one that's going to stand out. The other fun thing about this is it's not a knock on this that it didn't come on the original bracelet, which I think is pretty cool. Like right. the condition is fantastic. Partially with no because bracelet of that. marks on the back of the legs. Yep. Which is a selling point in many ways, you know? Yeah. I mean, you can get a bracelet wherever easily, uh, but to, to have it like really, really unpolished is, is pretty neat. I want to transition us to a slightly different portion of, of Rolex and vintage dive watch and vintage military watch collection collecting. About 60 of the watches in Sotheby's sale are coming yeah. from Alan Hammer Bloor, who yeah. is kind of this legendary collector. He's been collecting watches since the 80s. He's been involved in the Panaristi community. So there's a lot of vintage Panerai, vintage Rolex, modern Panerai in this collection from, from Hammer. He's in New York this week uh, to, to sort of say goodbye to the watches and the collecting community that's been so so kind to him over the years. It's, it's really sort of a cool story to, to see and hear and read about. Ben, is there anything you want to add to, to Hammer's story? Yeah, a Alan is not a guy I know super well, but a guy I know of extremely well. I mean, he's been around long before I was around. You know, really a like a, a great bastion of, of optimism within the watch collecting community and just beloved by all. I mean, I've, I've known him through Friends at Panerai and through Jeff Hess, who's now at Sotheby's, um, you know, for years and years. And, and really just like salt of the earth, great guy. Um, and in, in many ways, it's exciting and a little sad, of course, to, to see the watches go. But I think the, the expertise and scholarship that, that he's applied to his own collecting is, is considerable for sure. And there's some killer watches in there. Some really cool watches. I mean, from an emotional standpoint, I can't help but root for all of them to absolutely crush every estimate, regardless of like, is it representative of the market, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. You know, it's he's he's talked about this money will go and to benefit his family. It's yeah, it's not for charity, but like his family will need the support after he's gone. And, mm -hmm. and I think, you know, for me, I'm, I'm rooting for for every one of those. I'm not necessarily a big Panerai fan or yeah. or lover of Panerai or even knowledgeable about Panerai and um you know I I talked to Jeff Hess about that because he's he is the Panerai guy and um and apparently some really interesting watches in there I wish I knew more just because I think it would actually inform my understanding of who this guy is and why yeah. he's interested in what he is which is for me like yeah we all like the watches but I, I really love hearing about why people love the things they love or yeah. why they do what they do. And, and so it was interesting to see that also just kind of somber at the same time. Yeah. I mean, I think that this, just to speak of the watches, like this, the standout for me, there's a lot of great Rolex and now we're going to touch on that. But the standout for me was the Pam 21, which is a watch that I won't name names. Rich Forden looked at it and was like, Oh, stupid Panerai. And I was like, no bro, like this is a special thing. And I, I, I pulled it out for me to look at. Because, you know, like a lot of Panerais look the same. They all, in fact, look the same, or many of them do. And this is a watch I have lusted after for years. And the Pam 21 came out in the late 90s. It's a platinum case. They made 60 of them. This watch is particularly difficult to find with a full set. It had two case backs and, you know, special boxes and blah, blah, blah. This Hammer's watch, of course, has that plus, plus, plus. Uh, that is a very compelling watch. If if you're into Panerai or if you're not, it's, it's quintessential Panerai. And it's early. You know, it's late 90s, so we're talking, you know, approaching 30 years ago that's a really really cool watch from the hammer collection my pick was the uh 
Australian Navy big crown, 5510. Yeah. Uh, I think when I asked Jeff Hess, who you had on a few episodes ago, it, you know, if, if he's getting excited about a vintage sub like that, you know, it's pretty cool. Yeah. I think it's cool for the watch, but it also comes with all these Australian Navy sort of miscellaneous things. There's a cigarette case. There's like nose pins or nose clips or something like that. Field notebooks, all this crazy stuff that you just don't really find in a quote unquote watch set. So really cool to see all of that stuff uh, that, that comes with the lot. Yeah, I thought that was great. I mean, uh, I don't want to skip ahead too much, but that that sort of extra ephemera thing sort of makes me think of the one watch that I was... I'm curious to see what is going to happen. I, d I don't know that I can prognosticate on it, but if I can skip ahead to the the Weems watch, uh, the Admiral Bird Weems mm -hmm. watch, that's got Admiral Bird's flight logs. It's got all of these sort of associated things. And I've I've heard from some people that there's been a lot of interest from non-watch people museums those kinds of things uh trying to suss out i mean what a what a watch that has no direct comps for a longine yeah. weems um uh, you know flight watch might might bring i'm curious because i, I like the wild cards i mean you could yeah. show up and somebody could say oh this is a ten thousand dollar watch or it's a million dollar watch right and yeah. i think that, that makes me think of a, probably seven eight years ago there was this trend of like celebrity or provenance driven watches doing better outside of watch auctions they're like steve mcqueen's monaco sold for like seven hundred ninety five thousand dollars at a like hollywood memorabilia sale or something like that meanwhile if you if you you know the watch that sold at antiquorum sold for like 250 so we're talking 3x and it, it the the dream for every watch auctioneer is to find that thing that crosses into pop culture or just cult, you know political culture or whatever paul newman have you um and you know th this watch could do that. I mean, it, it may or may not, like it's not Paul Newman, it's 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 not Stephen Queen, but it's still a compelling thing that, that will appeal to different types of people. I would think a lot of aviation people have probably dumped a lot of money in their planes and maybe wouldn't have the estimate range of 100,000 to 200,000 to buy a uh, aeronautical sort of hero's watch. But sure. um, I don't know, it, it could it could do that potentially. I, I just, I have no idea. My, the, my one favorite thing, and we didn't get to see the movement, but apparently the movement is stamped extra and even Longine doesn't exactly know what that meant in the, in the case of that movement. There's hmm. no like documentation of that. And I, I like little stories like that. I mean, no we've just lost some of this and that's why it's important to like document these watches as best as we can. And when we find out something to share it, yep. because sometimes these things get lost to time if you don't. Yeah. Let, let's rattle off a few other watches that we liked at Sotheby's before we before we move on. I wanted to ask you for one wild card pick in the indie, modern, neo vintage, whatever else we haven't covered from Sotheby's. RM thirty five. That was mine too. That was just that too. Was yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, I've said this many times, but like the RM thirty five to me is then it is not the Nadal. It is the RM I've kind of like secretly lusted after, not so secretly. The RM twenty seven is actually the one that I want, but that's a million dollars plus. This is the baby Nadal. You don't see him that often at auction. You see him on Chrono 24. You see him through gray market guys, whatever. But to just an RM35 is like that. That is a very neat RM. Uh, that is quintessential RM. And they had one in, in Sotheby's. Beater RM, right? It's a beater RM. Yeah. I've never seen one in person. I've listened to nerds like you talk about it on Hodinkee <laughs> Radio and whatever else. And yeah. just the, the, the mind... I was going to say mindfuck, but I don't want to. <laughs> you can swear here, Tony. It's okay. The mindfuck of picking that thing up five grams or whatever it is and putting it on the wrist. Uh, I didn't think I would like it as much as I did, but what a cool watch. That is the secret of RM. Like, you know, the, the guys like us here with the shawl collars and the glasses and such, like, we're like, ah, RM isn't for us. And then you pick one up. It's like, wow, this is actually really, really cool. You can't help it. Well, listen, that's a good place to leave the Sotheby's discussion. I want to get us over to Phillips, where we went uh, after that. Yep. I think we're going to start just with, with Vintage Paddock again, sort of circling back. We saw some of the same references. Honestly, we saw 15, 18 rows there. Uh, we saw 1463, some other stuff. Yeah. Ben, anything in particular? Yeah, I mean, look, uh, the, we'll we'll just touch briefly on the 14. Uh, on, I'm sorry, on the 1518 pink because we have to. Like, this is when watches are silly, right? Like, these are both of these watches. Is he either 1518? Any 1518 is amazing. To see two in pink gold, basically 30 blocks away from each other on the same day, is just bananas right i mean we said okay let's say there's 15 so we saw one seventh of the world's population of 15 18 pinks today yeah i mean how do you for me it's how do you process this and i know like this can sometimes be a criticism of coverage or whatever but how do i process something that i have no realm of understanding of spending that amount of money um you know you have to be very critical and sort of view it in a bubble i would i don't know um 
I don't know if we want to say which one we felt more strongly about. You can say that. I mean, I I would say if I was if I was buying and I had had the funds, I would be going for Sotheby's all day. I I don't know even necessarily that Phillips example is a consolation prize or anything like that, but I think that is something that you have to think about is there are probably people out there that are going to be bidding on one and if they don't get it, then or they go to the, it goes the other beyond one. what they felt that they would spend. They know that they might have a backup, and I think I just wonder how that impacts the the over, overall market when you have two together. I don't know if you have thoughts about which one or. Yeah, it's interesting that the Sotheby's one has an estimate of eight hundred to one point five, I believe, whereas the Phillips one is one point two to two point four. And I think we were all taken more by the Sotheby's watch, uh, condition-wise, and as I was speaking about sort of just the originality of the provenance, too, is something that makes it compelling for me as well. Uh, the the one at Phillips is well-documented as well. It's set in a private collection for the past 20 years when it it came to auction in the early 2000s, and I think that that sort of sale is well-documented and all of that type of stuff. So two super well-documented reference or examples of, of a the most famous reference there is in vintage watches, but the Sotheby's one I think is more compelling if you're just looking at them in a vacuum. Yeah. What else do we see in the paddock world at Phillips? The 3974 I think is just a crazy watch, right? The <laughs> yeah. repeater um, is is just a crazy thing to see. The 3974 is interesting to me, a because those have really starting to have a moment. Tom Brady has one now, apparently I saw That's on Instagram, right. That's right. Um, which is neat. Uh, this is the those... second one I've seen this year, which was surprising to me. There was one in Monaco and I just like... A 3974. Yeah, yeah. 39, I mean, th- those watches were really stone cold for a long time. They would sit at like Michael Safdie's shop up here in Midtown and just like, who's buying these things, you know? Now they're really hot. This watch is neat because it was worn out with a silver dial. It comes with an additional doré or kind of like shaded dial, slightly less less bright dial. Um, what's also neat about this is it's a, it's a naked watch, as we call it. So that there's no box, there's no papers for a 3974, which is kind of kind of crazy. Like, where do those go, you know? Uh, and in many ways, like if you want a 3974, but you don't want to pay, you know, big, big, big money, this could be a great opportunity. And like, there's, you know, there's one side of me that's like, oh, like, should I, should I do that? You know, like, it's a dream watch that like, I'm, I'm probably never going to be able to afford, you know, when there's a full set or certainly in, in any other metals. Um, so this is kind of compelling, but at the same time, also, do you want to put that kind of money into a watch that that's naked? It's surprising to me because I, I can't imagine a world in where this wasn't, you know, a, a watch that people were paying attention to. I, it, to me, like, I just wasn't around at that time. I also wasn't, you know, buying, buying watches or I'm still not buying watches at this level. But, like, it does check a lot of the boxes. It and, does. And, and so, I mean... It's, Who it's, knows? Maybe this was, you know, a, a young Ed Sheeran using the using the box for rolling papers or whatever and threw it at, threw it in the yeah. trash. You don't know. But like that doesn't bother me at all if the watch is good and interesting. And I mean, we listened to the chime. I thought it sounded wonderful. It's, yeah. You know. Look, I mean, first, it's part of the 39 series, right? So 3940 and 3970. I know you guys know, but I'll say this like we're really not. They were always well regarded, but they were not well bought and sold. Like they were just like, okay, like I'll get the fifty nine seventy, I'll get the 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 whatever fifty one forty, whatever. So th- this is the next version of that, the high end version of that. And I just think also it's like the the watch. You know, we were talking about this a little bit before. Like there's so many cool watches that again, the guys like us want to say like, oh, like this forty seventy two Vacheron at this price, like you should absolutely buy that. And then you do buy it, and then you know your taste change or you need the money for something else and you try to sell it. And you're like, Oh, wait a minute. Like I'm the only guy out here that, that wants this watch at this price. And I'm not saying that that's the case for a 3974 naked, but there's a lot more people out there. I mean, so on an episode that will come next week, John Reardon said, look, if you're buying a 5970 or a 3970 and it doesn't come with the full, full set, people don't want it at all. Right. And we're talking second case backs and you know, all, all that extra jazz. And so I do think on the paddock, buyer in particular unless you have a bounty of, of watches you you probably do want a full set 3974 if you're i mean look no matter what it's going to cost you six figures i mean is this like the don't don't settle on condition kind of situation too like you know buy buy the best you can afford and if you can't afford the best then don't don't necessarily buy it uh, i'm i'm not saying that yeah. uh, to, to me it's like uh, again like the, the, the market for 3974j is there's not that many people out there no. buying that watch. Like there's just not, you know, relative to a Daytona or anything like that. So, you know, if you want to be able to sell it, you want to be able to sell it quickly and without without any excuses. And I think a naked watch, there will be some excuses. It will be priced that way for sure. Um, but it, it it would be a challenging one for me, I think. Two two watches on the opposite end of the spectrum for me in terms of price that are like there might not be a huge market for them, but they're pretty great. Uh, the Sector Dial Reference 96 yeah. I thought was great. Again, like not a huge ticket watch, um, 
but made me happy to see it. Indirect center seconds, which I thought was interesting. And I, I just, you know, I'm happy to see that. I've always been looking for an interesting reference 96. That's cool. Opposite end of the spectrum for things that there's probably not a ton of buyers for, but will maybe, I'm hoping, get a good price is there was a pocket watch that I was honestly very happy to see everybody go around the table and, and handle this pocket watch and chime it. Um, 844 uh, Patek perpetual calendar inline perpetual calendar or an Amer- american perpetual calendar pocket watch yeah with repeater with repeater and uh and in white gold in white gold there's two known the other one is buyer sign in a, in a uh, prominent collection and um this sold in 2016 for 472,000 swiss francs uh, i hope that it it continues to do that but again like if you're buying that watch you better better darn love it and and sit on it because uh, it's going to be hard to sell. There's a couple people in the world, and yep. and one of them already has one. And so. thankfully, there's only two of them, so it's yeah. not like you're going to have a lot of options. So if you want it, like now, now's the time. And this is also X Jean Claude Beaver, right? Yep, yep. Um, I think you know, I'm not sure what the bump on provenance like that is like. It's nothing against him. I just I'm very always very curious on a possibly five hundred thousand dollar watch how much people are paying a little bit extra because it was in that collection. Um, but. So I think it's a great watch, and it, uh, like I said, it did make me really happy to see you guys actually enjoying pocket watches, despite how much uh, shit I get for being the pocket watch guy. I don't know from who. I never give you shit <laughs> about that. But Guys, as fun as the paddock discussion has been, I'm a bit more of an everyman, so I wanted to talk <laughs> about a, a different brand right now. Uh, probably my favorite watch of the day was a Vacheron 4072 chronograph at Philips. It had a beautiful, a beautiful two-tone dial sharp gold case and a matching gay frere bracelet one of my favorite references no one really cares about it because it's a vacheron because it's 34 millimeters because it's usually in precious metals but uh in person the thing is gorgeous it wears like a dream uh you guys can have your paddocks your complicated paddocks your 130s i'll take the 4072 and it's got a low estimate of fifteen thousand dollars right like 15 to 30 right 15 to 30k i yeah. think uh i think it'll blow that out of the water i yeah. won it in our mock auction for Forty thousand dollars, let's say yesterday, and let me tell you, I still think I got a steal after seeing it in person. Um, it's a gorgeous watch, and it's one of my favorite references. Yeah, and I think also, so we we were kind of toured around the the collection by Paul Boutros and others. And Paul's somebody that has written for our site. I've known him for a long time. Yeah. When he gets genuinely excited about a watch, that's a very good sign. And this guy was thrilled over it. He's a Vacheron guy. You know, he said he spent some time kind of chasing this one. Comes from South America, I believe. Uh, this is a real deal, authentic, you know, kind of original family, untouched 4072. If it goes anywhere near even the high estimate, I mean, it's a, it's a, we've been saying this for years, but we're going to say it again. It's a bargain. Vintage Vacheron remains a bargain. This is, I, but I mean, let's be honest. I think this is a Phillips estimate and not necessarily a representative estimate is how I read it. I mean, maybe that's just tinted by the fact that I just handled the watch and, one, you said 34 millimeters. That, it did not strike me as, as that in person, which goes to show how much... Uh, it wears bigger, right, yeah, guys? It yeah, wears I mean, bigger. I hate saying it, but it's a great, great yeah, watch. Yeah, the 4072 is a, like a really flat case, and flat watches tend to wear a little bit bigger. Um, but it's it's an absolute killer. I'm, I'm right there with you on that. Do you guys want to talk about the Vacheron market any further than that? I think it's sort of an interesting discussion we've had before. Yeah, uh, challenging. It's really challenging. Vintage Vacheron, again, I, I mean... As long as there's been a Hodinkee, I've been saying vintage Vacheron is like a great deal, right? And in particular, like the 1950s, 1940s stuff. It goes up, it goes down, it goes left, it goes right, but it remains just a a secondary player on on the vintage scene. It just does. Just because it's not Paddock? Yeah, because it's not Paddock. <laughs> that that's why. Yeah. Uh, again, like the, the I mean, look, even vintage Paddock. I mean, take yeah, take yeah. the 1518s out of it and look at 1463s, look at 3448s, look at 2526s. Like these watches air quotes should be the thing that everybody starts wants to work towards. But you kind of skip right over that. Like if you're a, a mega collector, you might have some modern Patek or whatever and then you you dip a toe for a 1518 or a 2499 or like a, a seriously fuck you watch and you skip right over the 1463s, the 2497 Js and sometimes Rs. Um, you skip right over that stuff. Um, and I think, you know, if you're skipping over that stuff in, in the Patek world, you're definitely skipping over the Vacheron stuff. Which is too bad because, I mean, I think there's... There's an argument to be made um, that a lot of these watches are oftentimes rare in, in some cases just because they of how. Yeah, in I, many mean, cases, I yeah. mean, um, so, you know, I've seen it at auction I've, uh, the, a couple times this year. There were some earlier in, in uh, 
at specifically the Monaco auction, um, where just it's like okay nobody nobody's gonna pay for an ultra thin minute repeater from yep. them that's a fantastic fantastic shape uh sold after under the reserve to somebody in the room uh but yeah it's too bad but then you see a watch like that that uh chronograph and it makes you think that maybe you have you everything care, wrong. Right? yeah well yeah, yeah or care. you just have it all wrong and like wait why why am i not caring but uh, as you mentioned sometimes these things are hard to get out from under if you move on to something else or you find something that you've been looking for for forever yeah. and you just need to free up some cash um that's not the kind of watch that unfortunately you want to be sitting with yeah i mean it's, it's a it's a fool me once shame on me type of situation fool me twice you know it's uh it's it's one of those things where it's just like okay like i've i've I love Vintage Vacheron. I've owned quite a few. Uh, but at the end of the day, and I know many people like this, it's just like, all right, even if it is X and you think it's a great deal, try to sell it on the secondary market. You know, And it's just like, if you have a Patek, if you have a Rolex, you might not get exactly what you're asking, but there will be liquidity. There will be the opportunity to sell it. Vintage Vacheron, it's it's a much different world. It just it just is. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. In fact, actually, I will say it's wrong, but it's ju it just is. And sometimes you just can't fight with what what just is. Yeah, you know what's interesting is I have seen sort of increased interest in their neo vintage stuff, their ultra thin QPs from the '90s and and stuff like that. That's very similar to uh, the vintage AP QPs. But, but don't you think that's because those were so cheap that it like and like you get these guys that are on Instagram and kind of pumping this stuff up because they're so cheap. Like these va the Vacherons we're talking about here are not that cheap, right? Like that's these are true. not sub ten thousand dollar watches. No, it's true. A few years ago, you could have gotten one of these ultra thin QPs for the same price as, say, a steel uh, vintage Vacheron, whatever, from the 50s. And I think the QP is a lot easier. It's an easier story to tell, I think, sure. uh, especially when a 3940 is 40 or 50 or whatever it would have been at the time. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's an easier story to tell in the value, and that's why they have increased in value. So it is, it's a bit of a different thing, and I think telling the story of neo-vintage complicated watchmaking is, is a different yeah. market to to try to explain. Yeah, the, the last thing I'll say about Vacheron and then we can move on is I, I think the, the challenge there is because, and Paul Boutros can fact check this for me later, but I, I believe most of the watches made before a certain year, forget the year, are unique, like effectively unique. So whereas with Paddock, you can say, oh, I've seen a 130 with a sector dial or this long signature or whatever. Like there's a market for that because there's been five similar sold in the past. With Vacheron, that, that doesn't really exist. There are similar watches, but never the same. And as, as you mentioned very, very correctly, they are way rarer than than vintage paddock by like pr pretty wide margin. So like you have even less of them on the market. But you want you want that like safety blanket. You want to know when what the market is. Yeah. yeah, when you're spending that much money, you, you want to know what the know, comps are. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, did I overspend on that? And I mean, I think even even in our fantasy auction the other day, like I had that same feeling as without real money is like, right. oh, did I just get goaded into overspending on something? Well, okay, if you're talking about a watch that the asking price is two hundred fifty thousand dollars for a minute repeater or something like that. How do you know that that you, you made don't. the right decision? Right. And you don't. Yeah, there's a thin line between uh, rarity and obscurity. Someone once told me, and I <laughs> think that that lesson applies here. Indeed. Anything else that you guys saw at Phillips? I could talk about RM some more, but Ben, I want to kick it to, over to you first. That was a great RM at Phillips too. <laughs> actually, that was a really early one. That was an RM two. Let's see what else did I see at Phillips? They had an another nice Vacheron, the forty one seventy eight. We'll just keep pulling on the Vacheron thread. Um, what? Oh, they had that fourteen sixty three pink. Uh, Serpico Elino, uh, which is, you know, that's a really neat spec of a 1463. And I think a little stronger case than the, the Tiffany one over at, at Sotheby's. I, I will say that the Tiffany Yellow Gold Breguet had a little bit more charm for me. Uh, it could just be it felt different different than, than most of the other 1463s you see out there. I think there was a little like wabi-sabi kind of like whether it's the patina or the signature at the top or whatever it was like that that made that just an interesting 1463 at Sotheby's, but like it's a different buyer to me. Yeah. If if you're if you're buying the Serpico sign 1463, you're you're probably somebody that wants just a little bit more perfection yeah. out of the whole thing. Yeah. But. Oh, actually, now that I think about it, there are two other watches at Phillips. Actually, a few other watches at Phillips. A they have some watches at Phillips. They have some know. watches. Uh, Neoya Hita. Yep. They which, have over there. Yeah. Uh, I know you like that. No, I think it's I think it's going to be one of my picks maybe for overlooked watch for the year um, yeah just his his work is really interesting and i'm i'm coming around in conversation yep. to that but um i i think it's a really great watch uh and the, impossible to get at retail effectively like they're selling like they, they do the raffle thing and you get like 
you know, there's like 10 of these watches allocated per year or something like that. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think also that's a low, a relatively low estimate range, which is exciting. Yeah. It's meant to entice people potentially into buying it, but I'll be yep. curious to see what the market decides is, is that opposite end of the spectrum space dwellers. Yeah. That's where I was going. Not everybody next, yeah. gets to see a space dweller every day. So I thought that was pretty, pretty fantastic to see. Space dwellers neat. I, I own one, which is public information. Um, they are, like I said, not everybody gets yeah. to see one every day. I, I happen to, uh, <laughs> they are so rare, so neat. So, uh, not understood, right? We don't know. Nobody knows the history of these things at all. Like there were some dials at, at auction a while back. There were watches that we believe became, you know, made, this watch, uh, the, the lore is that they were sold in Japan, you know, 1955, I'm sorry, 1965, 1966 through seven. This watch was serviced in Japan, so lending some credence to that. But at the end of the day, we don't know. And on the paperwork, we don't frankly even know if that dial was in that watch when it was serviced. I'm not saying it wasn't, to be clear, but we don't know any of that. The service does not indicate what dial was in there. It does not say Space Dweller on the service. Um, but it also doesn't say Explorer on the service correct, either. Correct, correct. These are really tricky watches. And again, like, like you're coming from somebody who bought one many years ago and continues to own it. I think these are incredibly special watches, kind of no matter the story. Uh, it's no different than like, did the Paul Newman dial that's in so-and-so exist there when new? It kind of is, is irrelevant. You're paying for the dial. And a Space Dweller dial is the absolute coolest dial. We do know that it sits in the serial range of sort of known Space Dwellers, mm -hmm. if you will. So that at least is sort of correct. Uh which is good to see. But yeah, it's probably the coolest 1016 dial I've ever seen. I love the honeycomb dials as well. Yep. I'm wearing a 1016 right now, but it's a boring old matte dial. And so I feel lame. that way even so more lame, so after yeah. seeing that space dweller. Yeah. But it's it's one it's probably the most beautiful 1016 dial. I, I saw the albino one that Phillips sold back in May. Yep. If this space dweller doesn't sell for if it doesn't blow that out of the water, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw a fit it, because it, it's it, it's beautiful. It, it should. And it, again, Jeff Hess and I talked about Explorers on on our podcast together, and the the Explorer, you know, is the choice of gentlemen such as yourself. I've owned a few, like the really thoughtful guys tend to buy these watches, but they never bring big money. You know, when I when I say big, I mean above two hundred thousand. Like all this money is big, but when you, when you see standard stock and trade, you know, gilt, whatever Explorer dial subs trading for four or five, whatever. You're seeing mill subs in the three, four, five range. Like a, a, a really, really special Explorer 1016 Space Dweller should be 250, 300, in, in my not so humble opinion. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, I, I would have gone even higher, but again, this is all imaginary money, but like 325, 350. I, just, just at this point for me, it's like that would be the one. I, right. I, what else? I, I've come around to Explorers. I used to not be a 1016 guy, and yeah. now I think I, you know Rich Ford in the corner has cajoled me enough times and and just beat it into me. But uh, I, like, if why if you have the ability, why buy anything else? Like, get the one and and be done. Yeah, agreed. The most expensive sort of Explorer family watches I can think of are some basically pre Explorers that sold last fall. Uh, low 200s, I think. Rolex bought one of them. Uh, they had kind of Everest provenance, basically. So that's basically the highest we've seen. Uh, I don't think the Space Dweller will touch that. But just for reference, that's the most expensive sort of Explorer family watch I can, I can think of. But before I let you guys go, this is my show now, I guess, Ben. Great. Um, before, we, before we leave it here, I, I wanted to ask you guys if you had a favorite watch that you saw today. There's some nice 25, 26s out there that I really liked. There was a watch that I was really looking forward to see at Sotheby's called a 3428, which is basically like a, it is a 2526 with the upgrade. The next version. generation. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. From the early 60s instead of 50s. That was pulled from the online sale for, for some reason. Uh, we'll come back to that one. But that one was the one I was probably most excited to see. I'll be honest, the, the 1463J Brigade Tiffany, like that's, that's my kind of thing. You know, that is... That is, I'm a Tiffany guy. Uh, I'm from New York, as, as you know. A worn watch, like the super minty stuff never really appeals to me. It's just kind of boring. Like that feels like a collector that's just collecting to, to collect, not to own and wear. Uh, that was a really compelling thing. John Player special. I, oh, I, I, I no, just have right. to. I, <laughs> you're right. Oh, you, I, win, you win that one, actually. Yeah. No, that, I mean, watch it's, is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's fantastic. And, and I am a big bracelet guy. Like per, I spent time thinking about bracelets for wa watches that like how much time do you spend thinking about bracelets? I, I would say like i spent probably a good 30 percent of watch related thinking time thinking about bracelets and bracelets yeah no i mean like i i think it's you know or at least if i'm going to pick a watch to wear generally across the board i'll, I'll want on a bracelet or yeah. beads of rice or something like that i'll take that all day every day of the week 365 days of the year I'll take and that yet watch. you chose the watch without a bracelet 
No, and I know. That's what I'm saying. So yeah. that's that just goes to show how great that watch is. Now, if I wanted to wreck the back of the lugs, I could find a bracelet and put it on. But yeah. Yeah. Tony? As established, I'm a bit of an everyman. So all I need is that simple Vacheron 4072. As I'll remind you, the estimate was 15 to 30. You guys chose watches well into the six figures. Okay, okay, uh, but but can I can I put like a two hundred thousand dollar floor or something like that? Because I want to I want to see if you were just going all out. What no, no, get? no. It's my favorite watch uh, of the entire of the entire sale weekend. Um, you know, as a Chicagoan, I'm not much of a Tiffany guy either. The 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 signature just doesn't do that much for me. The JPS is is a cool watch that was in beautiful condition, but if I can get something like the forty seventy two for for that cheap. Why not, baby? Are you going to bid on that watch? No. We, we picked our favorites, effectively. So which, which watch do you think is, is kind of the most, the, the, the greatest bellwether for the entire watch market right now? Is it the JPS? Is it the Pink 1518? Are those a little bit too, too, too big dog to, to kind of represent the market at, at, at large? Is it, you know, Phillips has a really nice mint 6263 Big Red, which to me, I've actually, I think, described as the bellwether of the vintage market. Is it that? That would have been my pick, but now I look like I'm just copying what you're saying. Okay. So I don't, I don't know. When I'm I mean, right, I'm right, Mark. I, I think you know this might be not necessarily a bellwether of the the highest end of the vintage market because I have a sense that like things like 1518 or 1463 are going to stick relatively yeah. in a range that they're known for. But I would say maybe uh, actually we didn't talk about it. A Cartier Benoit that was at Sotheby's that had. Mm. Uh, provenance from charlie chaplin giving it to his wife yeah. like okay how much pe are people willing to spend on uh you know sort of a mid low estimate watch um below thirty thousand dollar estimate yeah. and pay for the provenance like how are people going to feel like yes it's it's not representative of every single benoit but it gives me a sense of like okay are people going to pay up for this kind yeah, of thing what do people or, care about, or, right? or or are they not yeah i've got a good one for you i think uh there's a tropical dial 5512 Submariner at Sotheby's. It's actually from the same collector that has that 1463 that you keep talking about, which I think kind of shows the sort of level of this Submariner. Uh, some guy that's buying Breguet Tiffany signed paddocks would be interested in in this sub. It's it's on a Jubilee bracelet, yeah, it's but cool. it's it's a really nice watch. The case is nice and the dial is obviously beautiful. Uh, you know, again, Hess was really excited about it, and he's sort of the the Samariner guru. So if he's excited about it, I think it'll be interesting to see how uh, a good Rolex Samariner like that does on to see what it says about the market. I think the estimate is five hundred fifty to a hundred, I should say. Yeah. So we'll we'll see, but we, I think that's a good one. It, it is that. I mean, let, let's be clear. That's a spicy estimate for a Samariner. Totally. In yeah, and I also think that there was the the fifty five thirteen that they had at, at Sotheby's as well that like Comex dial. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that that's a little extra sauce there. Will people continue paying up for that? Do people want extra pro, uh, provenance with how it was used, how yeah. it was not used? I mean, that's again like if you're taking a, a watch plus that is still not a fifteen eighteen or something, but like looking for watches with a little bit extra. That might be an interesting one to watch as well. Yeah, I mean, look, th th this is, the, I think that for me, it, it probably is the 6263 Big Red because it's very easy to understand. It's a full set. It's a good watch. But I think, I think weirdly, the things that are probably most telling, you, you know, at Phillips in particular, you usually get this kind of like auction bump where like you can go to Chrono 24 and buy the same watch for a little bit less. A 15202, a 5711, like the most basic watches ever, like that I think will be a really good indicator of where things are. Is there still hype around the market where, you feel like you can't get a fifteen two hundred two, or now a sixteen two hundred two at auction or at, at, at retail, then maybe it'll do well. I don't know. So we have uh, Sotheby's coming up tomorrow, which would be Thursday, December seventh, and then Phillips is over the weekend, Saturday, Sunday. These are public auctions. I encourage you guys to go check them out. Go check out the previews. It's one of the best ways to learn about watches. And we will see you next week with our good friend, Mr. John J. Reardon, talking about vintage Patek Philippe. <laughs> <laughs>